Well, you made it. It's July, and it's Baptism Sunday at City Church. If you're visiting today or you're new to City Church, my name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor here. God bless you. So thankful that you decided to join us, all of our locations. If you're new, City Church is one church in five different locations. So Middletown, Bridgeport, Hartford, North Campus, here in New Haven. Can we just say hello to our whole church family? We're streaming live. Good morning, church. Welcome to church. Hello. Uh, Our sound guys, I think I lost my monitor, so if we can make it work, that would be great. But if not... I will survive. It's a, it's a special Sunday here today. If you've never been to, uh, to this type of a service, we've actually never done this at all of our locations on one day. So we have live baptisms at every location all across the state of Connecticut at every service. And so in New Haven alone, we baptized 44 people in the first service. I mean, it's just like, it's getting crazy. So, uh, so it's going to be an exciting Sunday on a lot of levels, and uh, this is not our norm. Like I said, if this is your first time, uh, we don't always do it just like this, so it's going to be a little bit wild today. It might go a little long. Um, we don't really know what will happen. So I just encourage you, uh, roll with it, have some fun with us, enjoy the service, and we're glad you're here, especially if you're new and you're kind of checking us out. Okay, a couple things. As we jump into the sermon today, we've been in a multi-week series on the life of Nehemiah, specifically looking at this idea idea of leadership and vision, right? The life of vision. And so if you're not familiar with Nehemiah, it's an Old Testament story about a man who rebuilds the wall in Jerusalem. And we saw how he received vision, how he planned his vision, how community came around his vision. And then of course, opposition last week, how the opposition that faced his vision was overcome. So you remember these pieces? Everybody tracking with that so far? If you were with us these last few weeks, you remember it. Today, I want to look at the results of a life with a God-inspired vision. What happens when a community, when people gather around a God-inspired vision, what are the results, okay? And so if you have a Bible, Nehemiah chapter 9 is where we'll start. Nehemiah chapter 9, starting in verse 6. It says this, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven and the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. The host of heaven worships you. If you want to jot some notes down today, I want to talk to you on the subject of when God grips your heart. Come on, balcony. When God grips your heart. When God grips your heart. Would you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for all that you're doing all across our locations. We want to welcome the Spirit of Jesus in the room right now. I just sense your presence. I sense your nearness. God, I pray that you would manifest your presence today, that you'd make yourself known in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Can you remember the last time God gripped your heart? Can you remember the last time anything gripped your heart? When in your life you became consumed or obsessed with something. Maybe if you're honest, you know, for you, you know, this idea of, a, of your heart being gripped. Uh, you know, maybe it was something that you bought. Like a, like a new car or a new house or, or something that you've owned and you say, boy, it's so important to me, it's so exciting, it's gripped my heart. Or maybe if it's a, you know, not something you bought, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you just met this special girl or met this special guy and you've become consumed with just being around them, you're always texting them, always interacting with them, constantly consumed with them and with what's happening with them. Or, or maybe it's a certain sports team. Maybe you love this sports team or that sports team, and when they're, you know, uh, in the middle of the playoffs or in the middle of their season, you're watching everything, you're paying attention to everything, it's gripped your heart. Or maybe there's a TV show that you love to watch, and you find yourself like dreaming about it and thinking about it and kind of like meditating on it all the time. It's gripped your heart. Well, in the Bible, what we see here in the book of Nehemiah, this process that the people of God go through, and they get to a place at the end of this book where God has gripped their heart where God has become the overriding obsession of their heart. And here's what I believe. I believe right now at our church, at this time, in this season, that God is doing a work in your heart and in mine where every one of us are turning and things like what we own and the people we love, they're important things in life, but there's something that transcends those things. There's a desire for God that is bigger and greater and more powerful and more substantive in our life because God has gripped our hearts. 
And I believe that that's what's happening right now in our church, that all across the locations, all across this region, God is raising up a people, doctors, teachers, attorneys, those that work in retail, those that are single and at home with their kids, those that are struggling to make ends meet right now, those that are in between jobs, all different walks of life, different races, different ages, different people, but one thing unites us together, God has gripped our hearts. He's gripped our hearts. Turn to the person next to you and say, you got to get a little more excited today. You got to get a little more excited today. Because today I want to show you what happens in a community when God grips the heart, all right? What happens in a community when God grips the heart? I want to show you Nehemiah chapter 8. You can follow along with me. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to move quickly through this. Of course, there's a lot of text to cover, so we'll just cover a few brief pieces of it today as we prepare for baptisms. It says this in chapter 8. It says, and all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. Richard Nixon was there with his cabinet, and, oh wait, that's not what it says. And they told Ezra and the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra and the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women. You thought the Bible wasn't relevant. It's all in there, man. And all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before their water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now, if you're just jumping in today, I know that that it might be a little bit of a confusing text, so let me back it up. The people of God return to their land. They return to Jerusalem. God gives them a mission to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. They accomplish that mission. The wall is completed, but most of the people live outside the city. And so at this time, all the people that had been wandering, all the people that had been living outside the city start returning to the city, and the priest starts reading the Bible to them. And for many of them, it was the very first time they ever read the Bible or heard the Bible, and so they stay for hours, and they ask him to explain it. And they begin to understand it. And this is the first thing we see happening in a community when God grips your heart. When God grips your heart, drifting people return. Drifting people return. And I believe that right now, all across the state of Connecticut and all across New England, in Jesus' name, drifting people are returning. Maybe you're here today and you grew up religious and you did a communion or you did this or that, you had some traditions, but God has not been central in your life. It's been three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and you barely ever think about God. You think about your business, you think about your relationships, you think about your bank account, but the most important thing in life, where you'll spend eternity, has been far from your mind. I am telling you right now, you're in the middle of a move of God's Holy Spirit where drifting people are returning, and you may be one of them today. In Jesus' name, drifting people return. You know, that's the passion of our heart here. We say that we believe that in our lifetime, in our lifetime, this region known as New England, the least church region in the United States, will become the most spiritually vibrant place on earth. I believe that. I believe that. And I believe we're in the middle of it right now. Drifting people return. But look at what happens next in this chapter. It's chapter 8, verse 8. It says this, they read from the book of the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this is a holy day to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Now this is interesting, right? Because what's going on? They follow the vision, they rebuild the wall, they return to the city, and now everybody's weeping as they hear God's truth. See, they hadn't really registered the truth of God until this point. And when they read the scripture, God started softening their heart and convicting their conscience. And they started feeling like they had not honored God with their life. See, when God grips your heart, conviction awakens your conscience. You can jot that little thought down. Conviction awakens your conscience. I'm sure that there's some in the room that things you've done in the past, they didn't even bother you. You could uh, sleep with them and, and drink that and, and lie about that and do this and do that, and it was never an issue for you. You could just go about your normal life. But when God grips your heart, conviction starts to awaken your conscience, and you no longer can live with business as usual. You no longer can be just an average life. You have to seek God. You have to honor God. You have to search for God. You have to obey God. Conviction awakens your conscience. And some of us right now, today is the day where your conscience is awakened, where you begin to realize that you've been living far from God for far too long. And today's your day to be reconciled to God because conviction is awakening your conscience. Let's look what happens next in verse 13. Stay with me. 
It says this, on the second day, the heads of the fathers, the houses of all the people, the priests, the Levites, came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. So they come for a second day here to study the Bible. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all the towns of Jerusalem. Go out of the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it's written. Some of you are very confused. Stay with me. I promise it'll make sense. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and at the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made these booths and lived in the booths from the days, uh, for from the days of Yeshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. Now, you may not be very familiar with many of the traditions of people of God in the Old Testament, and so it's important to fill in a couple gaps. In the Old Testament, they're given a number of commands, and one of the most important commands was to obey God by celebrating three specific feasts every year, three big festivals or celebration. The first one you may have heard of was the Feast of Passover. This was a time where the people of God celebrated the fact that God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt. The second feast that was very important was the Feast of Pentecost. This was when they celebrated the harvest that had come in and the first fruits that God had provided by giving back to God and by celebrating. But the third feast was known as the Feast of Tabernacles, okay, or the Feast of Booths. And here's what this feast was all about. It was to remember that for 40 years the people in Israel had wandered in the wilderness, and yet God in his perfect plan had brought them to the promised land and had provided permanent homes for them. And so every single year the people of Israel are supposed to take a week and live in a tent in their front yard, okay? And so your house is right there and then you build this tent out of branches and you're supposed to live in that tent for a week as a remembrance to what God had done in previous generations. Now, over the years, the people of Israel had neglected this and they weren't doing it. Why? Probably because it's pretty inconvenient to live in your front yard for a week, right? I mean, that's not necessarily my idea of a party. Like, I don't really want to live in my front yard. But God commands them to reinstate this festival. Why? Because he understood that a physical act can have spiritual significance. See, what God was showing them is you sleeping in a tent for a week is a way for me to remind your heart that I am in fact faithful and that I will be faithful in the days to come. What he's teaching us here, stay with me, is that a physical act has the power to initiate a spiritual encounter. Somebody stay with me. A physical act, don't miss this, has the power to initiate a spiritual encounter. Maybe you know where I'm going. Because today's Baptism Sunday, church. Today's Baptism Sunday. You know, and on the outside, it might just seem like, well, you know, you get kind of put under water and you come up out of water. What's the big deal? It's just a physical act. Friend, what you need to see today is that the physical act has this power to initiate a spiritual encounter in your life. Today, as we jumped into this baptism, we had over 75 people signed up to be baptized across our locations, okay? And what the Lord, yeah, that's exciting, but what the Lord spoke to my spirit this week is that there are another 75 people that will be here today across our locations who have not yet obeyed God and been baptized, who need to make the decision to obey God and be baptized today, all right? Today, I really believe that you're sitting in the chair right now. Let me teach just for a moment on this concept of baptism. Baptism is an act of obedience, all right? In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus gives us what's called the Great Commission. He tells his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations. And then the very first thing he tells them to do once they've trusted in Christ for salvation is be, anybody want to guess? Be baptized. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he teaches that when a person has placed their faith in Christ, their first act of obedience is to follow God's example in being baptized, okay? And so it's an act of obedience. Now, here at City Church, we practice what we call believer's baptism. What that means is I must understand what God has done for me, that Christ came, that he lived a perfect life, he died a substitutionary death on the cross for my sins, and he's risen again. I can't earn my salvation, but I can freely receive by faith the grace he offers, be cleansed of my sin, and be made right with God. When I know that that is true, I can personally choose to follow him, and in doing so, I should be baptized. Now, many of us in the room, maybe you grew up in a tradition where you were baptized as a baby. And I want to honor that because I believe that the intentions of your parents were good. But here's what I would say to you today. If that's you and you've not personally made the choice to be baptized yourself as a follower of Christ, you need to obey God today. 
You need to take that step of faith and obey God in baptism today as an act of obedience to him. Turn to the person next to you and ask him, is he talking to you today? Is he talking to you today? Is he talking to you today? See, baptism is a public declaration and it's also an act of faith. Not just obedience, but an act of faith. See, it feels silly for us. It feels silly for us to, you know, go underwater, come up out of water. Like Justin, it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult, you know, I get all wet, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. There's all these different elements, but what you have to realize is that spiritual actions initiate, or physical actions initiate spiritual encounter. Look how the Apostle Paul talks about baptism in Romans 6. He says this, you were buried, therefore with him, that's Jesus, by what? Baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might, look at this phrase, walk in newness of life. Do you see that? He's making a connection between your act of obedience and being baptized and the newness of life you experience in Christ. He's saying that when you take that step of faith, you're not just going under the water. You are cutting off your old life and you are stepping into a new life. So those of us that are being baptized today, here's what you should expect by faith in Jesus' name. You should expect greater freedom from sin from this day forward. You should expect a greater sense of unity with God from this day forward. You should expect a greater filling of the Holy Spirit from this day forward because your act of obedience is also an act of faith. And by faith, God sees He's your obedience and he honors it and he blesses you today. He honors it and blesses you today. And so Baptism Sunday is an act of faith. Some of us in the room, you know, maybe you're here and you say, well, I've just been kind of waiting for the perfect time. You know what I found in life? Perfect times don't really exist. Now's the perfect time. Now is the perfect time. And you might say, well, I, I can't get baptized. Whew, can't get baptized because I didn't bring clothes and I didn't bring, friend, we purchased underwear in every color. We purchased it in every size. We got shorts, we got shirts, we got flip flops. We got everything you need so that you can obey God. I'm not kidding, we've spent hundreds of dollars for one reason, just so you can obey God. It's that important to us. And it needs to be that important to you. And I've said this many times and I want to say it again, if you're a follower of Christ, but you've not been baptized as a believer, making the choice yourself, how can you say you're going to obey God in anything if you disobey the very first thing he told you to do, which was be baptized? Honor him today. You might say, well, it's embarrassing, Justin. Friend, embarrassment's a choice. Choose not to be embarrassed today. Choose instead to humble yourself, honor God, because he promises if you'll humble yourself, I'll exalt you. I'll exalt you, but if you are proud, I'll humble you. Today's an opportunity to humble yourself. See, when God grips your heart, we see it with Nehemiah, and we'll see it today. When God grips your heart, God's ways are observed. God's ways are observed. Just as they reinstituted the Feast of Tabernacles, we want to get back to primitive, authentic Christianity today and make that decision to be baptized. Just as we see in the Bible that a person makes the choice and turns and is baptized that time, that day. Obey God right now, right here, and be baptized. Maybe you've been a follower of Christ for 10 years, 5 years, 20 years, but you've not been obedient and been baptized. Today is your day. Or maybe right here, right now, you open your heart to Christ. There, there goes my monitor. It can come down now. It's, it's gone again. It's coming on. It's coming off. Hey, it's on now. There you go. There it is. Thanks. Hey, can we just put our hands together for our production team? Thanks, guys. I can hear what I'm saying now. Thank you very much. These guys work hard. God's ways are observed. Nehemiah 9, this is where we started. Look at it with me one more time. Here's what the people say after they've reinstituted the Feast of Tabernacles. Here's what they say. They say, you are the Lord, you alone. You've made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their hosts and the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them and the host of heaven worships you. I love that because the people in Nehemiah's day have been through so much. And now at the end of the road here, they've rebuilt the wall, they've moved back into Jerusalem, they've read the law, they've wept and repented, and now they just worship. They just worship. And I love that because it teaches us the real essence of vision and the real essence of life. See, when God grips your heart, the focus shifts to Him. The focus shifts to Him. And that's what I believe needs to happen today. That for every one of us, right now, right here, the focus of our life shifts off of ourselves and shifts to Him. What is He saying? 
What is he doing? And today, if you've been baptized as a member of the family of God, you get to celebrate transformed lives this morning. Amen. And if you haven't, well, then today is the day to obey God. Today is the day to take that step of faith. Today is that day to act and obey Him. Would you stand to your feet with me at all of our locations? I want to invite you today just to close your eyes. This is a sacred morning, and this is a sacred moment. And I just want to encourage you, let the focus shift to Him right now. Because I believe that right now God wants to grip your heart. And if you've been drifting, He wants you to return. He wants to grip your heart. Come Holy Spirit. He wants to awaken conviction in your conscience. He wants you to observe His ways. With your eyes closed, the first person I want to talk to today is the person who's far from God. You walked in and maybe because, you know, your cousin or your friend is getting baptized or maybe you just showed up today, it's your first time, or maybe you've been a number of times kind of trying to figure out what all this God stuff is about. I want to tell you that right now, God is reaching out for your heart you might think that he's far away. I came here to tell you that he's not. He's not far away. He's not far from you at all. In fact, he's gone to great lengths to never be far from you. See, and inside of every single one of us, there's a disease. The Bible calls this disease sin. It leads us to pride, to lust, to fear, to greed, to unbelief. It leads us to a thousand things that are destructive for our hearts and our lives. And that sin separates us from a holy God. Religion is our attempt to get back to God and to deal with our sins. And so we light candles, we pray prayers, we give money. We do a million different things, all in hopes that it will make us right before a holy God. Our hearts are aware that our consciences are scarred. But none of those things, friends, none of those things can make you right with God. The only thing that has the power to make you right with God is God himself. And God in his great love did what you could never do. He came to this earth. He became man, lived with flesh and blood, lived perfectly as a substitute and a representative for you, and then took on a death he did not deserve so that on the cross, all the sin that you've ever committed from the day you were born to the day you die could be washed away and paid for. God's justice could be satisfied. God's mercy could be displayed. As he hung on that cross, Jesus Christ absorbed the sin of your life. He died, and then three days later, he conquered death on your behalf and rose again so that by placing your faith in him, you could have eternal life. You long for a relationship with God. You may not even realize that you desire that, but I'm telling you right now, it's the great ache of your heart. More than any accolade, more than any success, more than any pile of money, more than any relationship, you need God in your life. Right here, right now, he's here. You may not see him with your eyes, but you can see him with your heart if you'll open your heart to him. He's calling your name right now. And he's saying, be reconciled to me. And you might say, well, how? It's far more simple than you might imagine. Even a child can do it. Trust in Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for your sins and he rose again. Personally receive him. He'll wash away your sin. He'll make you right with God. He'll give you peace and everlasting life. With your eyes closed right here, right now, have you wandered far from God? Right here, right now, do you need to be reconciled to your Creator because I'm going to give you a chance to take that step of faith. All across our locations, you're here today and you're far from God. You don't have to be. I want to lead you in a simple prayer of surrender to Jesus. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to take just a little step of faith to acknowledge that you need to make that choice today. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three. If that's you, just say, that's me. I need to turn my life over to Christ. God bless you. God bless you. Just keep it up just for a minute. God bless you. All across our locations in our balcony, God knows your heart. God bless you. You can put your hands down. God bless you. 
Put your hands down between you and God right now. You've made that choice. I'll lead you in a simple prayer. I urge you just to whisper this prayer. Say, Jesus, save me. I surrender. I believe you died and rose again. I place my faith in you. Give me new life. Thank you for receiving me right now. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Open up your eyes with me. All across our locations, look at me. The second person I want to talk to is the person that you're here today and you've trusted Christ for salvation, but you've not obeyed God in baptism. Now, if you're here and you've been baptized, but you sinned, you don't have to be baptized again, all right? But if you're here, and you, that's all of us, by the way, all of us that have been baptized, except for my wife, still waiting for her to sin. But if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus and maybe as a little kid or a baby you were baptized but you didn't really know what the decision you were making and as an adult now or as a person, it depends on your, you know, your understanding of the gospel. Sometimes a younger child can fully understand. But if you understand what it means to place your faith in Christ and you've not obeyed him in baptism, today's your day. It's between you and God, but today's your day, okay? And so here's what we're going to do. We've prepared everything for you to be able to participate today. We already have a number of people signed up. I don't know, 20-something or something like that. People have signed up already. But then there are a number of us that you didn't sign up, and you think, oh, it's just embarrassing, it's uncomfortable. All the excuses need to melt away right now. This is your time to obey God, okay? It's your time to obey God. So at every one of our locations, there's a table in the back. Right here in New Haven, it's in the back. I can see Craig back there already. He's going to give you a big smile when you go back there. But what we're going to do is on the count of three, every person that needs to be baptized today, I'm going to urge you on the count of three to get out of your seat and to make your way to that back table, okay? Now, if you registered already, good, make your way to the back table. If you have not yet registered, good, make your way to that back table. If you need to obey God and be baptized, today's your day. We'll get you suited up with all the things you need, get you a place to change and get you in line and get you to a place where you're acting in faith, obedience, and the Holy Spirit's going to meet you right there and you're never going to be the same in Jesus' mighty name. So let's pray. Let's pray, and then I'm going to count. Are you ready? Father in heaven, I thank you for every person here and in in Hartford, all of our locations. I speak the blessing of God in Jesus' name. I pray for uh, uh, just that right now you would grip the heart. God, just as we saw in the book of Nehemiah, that right now you would grip the heart, and that, Father, that there would be a hunger to obey you, a desire to honor you, a desire to seek your face above all else. Father, I pray for every person that needs to take that step of faith today. You'd give them the courage to take that step right now. In Jesus' name, now is the time. Today is the day. Father, I pray for that strength and that grace in Jesus' mighty name. One, two, three. If that's you, get out of your seat. Get out of your seat. Make your way to that back table. Come on, right now. Don't hesitate. Right now, it's your time. Go, 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 go. There you go. Go, go, go. All across this place. Go. Right now. Yes and amen. Come on. Make your way out. Say, excuse me. Come on, balcony. If you got to make your way down, go, go. Now's your time. Now's your time. All of our locations. This is it. Go, go, go. We're going to baptize some people this morning. In Jesus' name. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Celebrate them for another 60 seconds. Come on, give them another 60 seconds of celebration. Way to go. It's the biggest decision of trusting Christ with all things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, this is a day where God meets you. You'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. We're going to sing together. All of our locations, just take a moment and sing. Joey, lead us in a song. Thank you, Jesus. We welcome your presence today. Come on, church, let's sing.